Luke, I'm going to start with you. Um, if you weren't standing here, I picture you with your ear pressed against the hearing room where um, Pat Cipollone is testifying. After much ado, public and private pressure campaign um, aimed at soliciting his testimony, which, as we understand, he's providing today. Yeah, they're still in there. They just took a break about, I think, about half an hour ago and went back in. Um, the what I've heard so far is that Pat Cipollone is being cooperative, but is not answering questions as expected about his direct conversations with Donald Trump. We knew that he was uh, likely going to invoke attorney-client privilege over some materials. Uh, but the committee can ask him about uh, at least four really key categories. Uh, one is anything he saw or heard on January 6th itself, excluding uh, materials that are privileged. So that could be any of those conversations with Cassidy Hutchinson, with Mark Meadows, with other people in the White House as the mob is rampaging the Capitol. He's also free to talk about uh, uh, the issue with Jeffrey Clark and sending this uh, false letter to the states from the uh, from the Justice Department. He's, he's free to talk about conversations with members of Congress and also the role John Eastman played with uh, with plans to overturn the election. So there's a lot of ground here to till for the select committee. And he's, you know, he's been in there since a little after 9 a.m. So I think that, you know, they are covering a lot of ground as it's still going on. Um, I want to, I, I don't have all those categories, but I, I have a few of them. And I want to play for you, Katie Benner, um, some of the testimony where Pat Cipollone has very much been put in the room by the other very high level witnesses. Um, this is, um, Deputy Acting Attorney General Richard Donahue. All anyone is going to think is that you went through two attorneys general in two weeks until you found the environmental guy to sign this thing. And so the story is not going to be that the Department of Justice has found massive corruption that would have changed the result of the election. It's going to be the disaster uh, of Jeff Clark. Uh, and I think at that point, Pat Cipollone said, yeah, this is a murder-suicide pact, this letter. Pat Cipollone weighed in at one point, I remember saying, you know, that letter that this guy wants to send, that letter is a murder-suicide pact. It's going to damage everyone who touches it. And we should have nothing to do with that letter. I don't ever want to see that letter again. And so we went along those lines. Katie, that first uh, witness was um, Stephen Engel, who was the head of the um, Office of Legal Counsel. He was in that intervention, if you will, on the day that Jeffrey Clark was at least um, considered the acting attorney general for long enough for someone to change his title to acting attorney general in the White House call log. He's been described as having really the most descriptive term for what Trump tried to do that day, a murder-suicide pact. Talk about how much the committee already knows from Mr. Engel, Donahue, and Rosen, as well as um, his deputy White House counsels, Mr. Philbin and Mr. Hirschman. Mm -hmm. So what the Justice Department officials have already testified is they felt that the letter to Georgia, that the plan that Jeffrey Clark had was not only wrong because it was factually wrong, but they would undo the election and they would, you know, basically cause chaos within the Justice Department and then within America at large. But what Cipollone is saying, which I think is interesting, that the committee will really want to press on, is this idea of whether or not it was legal. It wasn't just a murder-suicide pact. It was a letter he never wanted to see again. It was something he did not put in front of him. And as the White House counsel, it's probably not just because it seems like a bad idea or something that seems a little bit morally uncouth, but because it's something for which people get into legal trouble. We also hear that echoed in the in the Cassidy Hutchinson testimony, where she talks about Pat Cipollone saying, Cassidy, if you allow the following things to happen, we will be hit by criminal charges for so many things. We could, you know, we could be in really big trouble here. So they're going to really want to know why. They're going to want to know whether or not he had conversations with, if not the president, um, with Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. And also keep in mind that while attorney, excuse me, executive privilege covers a lot of different kinds of conversations, it doesn't cover conversations that are crimes. Right, right. The, the, um, the whole sort of unveiling, Michael Steele, of what was going on in the West Wing while Donald Trump was president 
is worse than any of us thought it was. And the degree to which they invoked criminality is really one of the more shocking and underreported aspects of the public hearings. Here's Mr. Cipollone's deputy, Mr. Hirschman, speaking in, in pretty colorful terms about um, what he saw as the potential for rampant criminality. I thought the Dominion stuff was... I never saw any evidence whatsoever to sustain those allegations. I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I said, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. And then he screamed and said, I don't want to hear any other effing words coming out of your mouth, no matter what, other than orderly transition. Repeat those words to me. And I screamed and said, eventually he said, orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. And then I hung up on him. Jeff Clark was proposing that uh, Jeff Rosen be replaced by Jeff Clark. And I thought the proposal was asinine. And when he finished discussing what he planned on doing, I said, good. Excuse me, sorry, <laughs> a hole. Congratulations, you just admitted a first step or act you take as attorney general would be committing a felony and violating Rule 6C. You're clearly the right candidate for this job. Michael Steele, I played that again for, for two reasons. I mean, one, uh, many F bombs were dropped in the Trump uh, West Wing, and two, they talked about criminal exposure to such a degree that they talked about lawyering up with criminal defense lawyers. Well, keep in mind, it is the, the lawyers uh, advising the, the players in Trump's little, uh, you know, game cool. that, yeah, in his coup, that, you know, you need to be aware of what you are stepping into. Um, you know, they, but the, the, the big takeaway is despite that, they persisted. Despite that, they still persist. Donald Trump is out here having rallies right now, persisting in that that coup. And and so this is a very interesting moment for the January 6th committee to, to have Cipollone in the room to dance yes around the pinhead of you know executive privilege and attorney-client privilege such that it may apply. Um, but I think you can get him to fill in some very important lanes of the narrative. Um, and I think he realizes that because those lanes have largely started to be filled in by folks like Cassidy, uh, Hutchison, and others uh, who've made, who, as you started, put out a very stark view of this, right? And kind of laid it bare. Mm -hmm. So you either step into the room to put your color on it and to say, okay, this is what we advise and how we, like Mr. Hirsch was like, you know, we were telling people you better get a good lawyer because if you do this, it's going to be a problem. Um, or have that narrative overwhelm you in such a way that you're implicated criminally and culpable criminally in some fashion. I think Cipollone is doing that sort of, okay, uh, let me do a bit more of a Heisman. Let me do a little bit more of the, you know, CYA. Um, and, and that way I can go ahead and fill in the rest of those blanks that some of the committee members may, be, uh, may have as opposed to having them filled in by others.